This is Corey Willis with PPI, and you're listening to the Diesel Podcast. I'm Adam Blattenberg from Diesel World. This is Dan, owner of Dan's Diesel Performance. I'm Braden Fleece, and you're listening to the Diesel Podcast. What is going on, Diesel Nation? We're excited to have you guys with us today on the Diesel Podcast. We have not forgotten about our Power Stroke fans out there. And today we've got Cass from Choate Engineering, and he has been working on a ton of new upgrades and engine parts and just different things over the last few months. We're really excited to chat with him today. One of the major ones is going to be about 6.4 engines and a common failure that they have in this fix that him and the engineering team over there have, have been working on and testing. We're really excited to be able to tell you guys about that today. If there's any questions that you guys have specifically towards your 7.3, 6 liter, 6.4, 6 6.7 power stroke, we encourage you guys to reach out directly to Show Engineering. You can follow them on Facebook, Instagram, uh, jump on their website and just give them a call. And there's tons of questions. There's so many different applications and goals that people have for their engines that it's tough to just be able to answer them, you know, say on one podcast. So if you need that, that one-on-one help, have some specific questions and goals that you're trying to reach, just give them a call, reach out to them. They're more than happy to help you. All right, let's get to the podcast with Cass and learning what they've been working on at show engineering the last couple months. Cass, welcome back to the diesel podcast. I'm excited to have you on another episode where we get to catch up with what you guys have been doing at Choate Engineering. Well, we're delighted to be here as always. It's uh, always an honor and a uh, privilege to, to get to come on and talk about what we love doing. And I follow you guys on Facebook and Instagram and I see a ton of cool things that you guys have been working on through the summer, the fall, and even some things at, at PRI. But I wanted to ask you, what are some, some uh, major things or updates or just what you guys have been working on there at the shop? Sure. This year has been a uh, roller coaster ride for us, for sure. Um, it, as far as the company is, it's grown a lot. Um, there's a lot of things that we've been been working on, and um, the end of the year has been just kind of uh, uh, culmination. It's just it's funneled down, and it was just been. You hear about the FEMA crunch, but actually for us, it's generally like the PRI crunch because we're more active um, during the PRI show. As most, you know, most of your most of your performance guys, that's that's their show, that's their thing. So, <coughs> excuse me, we have been um, very, uh, very, very busy the last couple months. Um, we were, uh, we're very involved with uh, Rottler Manufacturing Company, which is, if you've ever had your, doesn't matter, if you've ever had your 350 Chevrolet or your, you know, whatever engine, it doesn't matter if it's a walk of shock, um, you've probably had uh, a Rottler machine or some type of, uh, one of their machines actually do the machine work. Roush Yates uses their um, uh, some of their their milling centers. Um, but anyways, they had invited us uh, when we were uh, in Washington uh, to come for a PRI show, and they wanted us to run some parts on their machine and show some of the stuff. So we got kind of a, a late invite um, at the end of the year, but it was an awesome opportunity. So we wanted to make sure that we took advantage of that. So that being said, we um, we you know, we double timed and tried to uh, get as much done at the last year so that we could uh, come out with something to show um, on the machines and stuff at the RI. So, uh, in conjunction with everything else we've already been doing, that was that was uh, it was an awesome opportunity. But uh, I'm glad that the RI. I'm glad it's 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 done and it's in the books for 2019. I'm excited about 2020. We've made some awesome contacts. We've got some exciting things working. We're with uh, several companies out there, um, UEM Pistons and Comp Cams and um, uh, Rottler for next year. So um, one of the things that we designed uh, was um, a billet valve cover, which it's not, you know, everybody does billet valve covers. That's not that big a deal. Um, But what we did was we're trying to kind of take the approach to our parts a little differently than most, whereas somebody would make maybe a cover like that and go, okay, well, that looks cool. I don't want my parts just to look cool. Um, I do want them to look, you know, neat, flashy, and showy and everything, and that's great, but I also want functionality. Um, I'm very much geared towards that way personally. Don't get me wrong, I like for things to look nice, but uh, at some point, you know, you can only justify so many thousands of dollars for something if it doesn't actually do anything, but this looks pretty. Um, but, I mean, there's people that, you know, make a living off of that kind of stuff. Like I said before, they'd say you build it seat covers that they thought they could get away with. <laughs> but um, anyways, one thing that makes the part that we were working on there uh, 
so useful is that it's actually the 6.4. It's what we consider one of the major fixes for the 6.4. Um, so uh, we're just about get that, ready to get all that wrapped up. And it uses an integrating, integrated oiling system um, that uh, will actually be um, feeding oil to the rocker assembly. So uh, that is going to be a huge help to the poor guys that have been suffering for lack of lubrication at the top end of the rocker assemblies, which has caused catastrophic failure of engines, and people don't even really realize it. That was one of the things we covered on a previous podcast we did was 6-4 common problems and, and fixes, and, and that was something that was there. But for, say, somebody who is a new 6-4 owner or hasn't had the issue yet, what is it? And then how can that product really change how how they can avoid, you know, say, issues with the rocker assembly or an engine build or, or something like that? Well... You know, the first 6 four that I ever bought, <coughs> and I guess it stuck in my mind so vividly, um, the problem with it, because it went from bad to worse, um, and it was one of those things that could have been fixed easily if I'd have caught it in time. But it was the first 6 four that I ever purchased, um, and I guess because of that experience, it, it, it's sticking in my mind that I um, just thought, you know what, I'm going to fix this thing. I'm going to fix it and be done with it. To know, you know, I, I think we may have covered this, and I just want to make sure that I kind of lay the groundwork so people understand where we're coming from on it um, try to be as quick as I can on it. Um, but, you know, you kind of have to go back to the predecessor of the 6-liter. We talked about the Huey injection system before, how it's, you know, a hydraulically actuated, electronically controlled unit injector that every time it, just like a 7-3, every time it fires the injector, um, you know, it's got a uh, relief that it spits oil on top of the rocker. You don't normally see a lot of failures out of the 6.0 rockers. Um, typically, if you do see a failure out of the 6.0 rocker, you uh, have got another, uh, a lot of times there's another underlying cause, and a lot of times it's guys that have already had, you know, machine work done, that, and then their valve recession may not have been right, and it smacked piston, and then it pushed up on it and broke the stamp, uh, the uh, stamped rocker. Um, but the 6.4 uh, in the haste that they were in, they decided to switch to the high-pressure common rail system. They thought, well, there's enough oil up there anyways, and they just really never gave a whole lot of thought to that. I don't know if it was intentional. I don't know if it was uh, it done in ignorance, but um, what happened, and it, again, it's a culmination of things, but uh, there's always been a lack of oil uh, in, in the upper uh, valve train area. So what the perfect storm, and it always is, Kind of like you go back on the 6 liter and the perfect storm of the EGR cooler and the head gasket failure, the perfect storm of the 6.4 uh, for the uh, typical camshaft failure um, or lifter failure is that because of the lack of lubrication, um, not only that, because of the uh, oil dilution for fuel getting into the oil, uh, and then on top of the lack of oil that's in the top of the head uh, starving out, the rocker that has a little... Um, uh, basically a uh, pivot ball that it rides on on the, uh, the uh, valve bridge. The valve bridge tends to wear uh, excessively. The pivot ball will wear to the point of the uh, clamps, uh, basically a tension spring the keeper that holds it in. It only will pop out. Then you've got the stamped uh, rocker arm on top of the, the uh, valve bridge itself, and they're riding metal to metal. Uh, there's really no lubrication there, and it continues to wear and continues to wear. What that does is it allows for more valve lash so that the, when the lifter is actually coming up off of the uh, off of the camshaft, it's slapping the top of that the top of the valve bridge, and it creates now valve lash. And so you've got the shock wave that's being sent back and forth. Um, and the middleman, the poor guy in the middle, the monkey in the middle, you might say, is the lifter, and he's just getting the nest beat out of him because the cam's hitting him, and then the springs are hitting him. Uh, and it's kind of going back and forth because, like I say, you, you have so much valve lash that was never intended. It's the hydraulic uh, adjuster or the, the, uh, the lifter, the hydraulic lifter, is supposed to have taken up that, but it can't anymore because it's, it's past that point. Um, so that creates a whole other issue. When that fails, then the lifter fails, and the lifter fails, it sends shrapnel through, and it wipes out the cam lobe, and the engine's done. So it's the perfect storm. It doesn't matter that all this could have been fixed if it had caught it 
you know, soon enough, and the guy had to put, um, you know, maybe new rocker arms or something like that on the on the engine. Um, generally, guys will call in or they'll make a Facebook post or an Instagram post or whatever and ask questions about, is this ticking normal on my engine? And, of course, it's not. Um, sometimes it has to do with injector tick. Uh, sometimes it has to do with the tuning uh, and you're hearing noises. Sometimes it has to do with a guy that's just paranoid and he's hearing noises. Um, but a lot of times it can be that the rocker arm has got a, uh, a tick to it because of that valve lash. So what we've done to develop that is, uh, or to, to remedy that by developing a solution is to add a drip edge bowling system, much like the 6.7 has, that's integrated into this, to, integrated into the, the valve cover itself, uh, and it's fed through oil under pressure all the time so that, uh, the rockers don't fail anymore because they're constantly lubricated and it resolves the issue. Um, it's so, I mean, you know, we're not, uh, we're ripping a play, you know, a page kind of out of the, the, the six, seven playbook and just going back for the guys that own these trucks. Ford's not going to do that. They're not going to spend that much money and time in developing something for an engine that's, you know, that's not that their concern anymore. Anyways, they're more interested in developing the current product that they have. Where the aftermarket comes in, like us, is we go, hey, guys, we know y'all have got a big problem over here. And we want to help. Uh, we want to be able to resolve this and get you something out there that will work for you. So it doesn't matter. Sometimes uh, it may not be that you're reinventing the wheel, but you may be changing the purpose for the wheel and changing the application, and that makes everything work really well. So the 6.7 drip edge oiling system, we... We used uh, a different routing system. Obviously, we couldn't uh, do what they did with where they got their oil supply, so we were able to do some other things so that they, the oil could be fed, uh, like I said, under constant constant pressure. And uh, it works you know, really well for that. And so that's what's so cool about the aftermarket as we think about it. You know, it's 2008, 9, 10 for the 6.4, but it's like Ford sells the most trucks. There's millions of those on the road. And it could be somebody who's owned it since new or somebody who just picked it up and you spend any amount of time on social media or just a, a Google search and you see these, it's like 6.4 engine build, you know, or rocker failures and, and, and things like that. So as far as having something that you can do preventatively to save that would be almost a, a no-brainer to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an expensive truck and, and the thing about it is, is, you know, you don't, you know, <laughs> for, uh, for a, uh, uh, um, I guess a, a lack of a better explanation. I mean, it's almost like, you know, the horse has got a shoe loose and you shoot them. I mean, you don't, it, there's things we can do to fix this. You don't have to put him down, you know, yeah. but, uh, there's an easy solution. Now, if it continues to go it's going to wind up causing major issues to the point of engine failure. Um, but, you know, and it looks cool. Don't get me wrong. They look great. We like them. But, we, you know, it's it's billet. Everybody loves billet, you know. It's kind of like Jeff Foxworth. He says, you know, if it's the Bachelors, uh, fishing gear, beer cans, if it's shiny, we like it. But, um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's billet. Um, but anyways, uh, it's, um, it's, it, it, it is a functional purpose. And on top of that, uh, there's a – well, I won't get into that, but there's there's another product that's going to go on top of this product that um, I guess I'll leave it as a teaser later. But it'll actually it'll it will cut down this this will keep people guessing because uh, I'm not going to tell, but it will cut down. <laughs> excuse me, it will cut down on about thirty percent of Facebook posts of these <laughs> low videos. You're welcome in advance, people. You know, you can send cards and letters. Uh, we're going to fix it for you. We're tired of them too, so there you go. Uh, but anyway, I had seen, I think it was maybe late in the summer, early fall and I'm kind of connecting this to, to PRI, which was recently, but I saw that you guys had, um, some really amazing photos of Matthew Fetty's race engine, um, in his, in his truck. And then I think it was there, the truck or engine, I, I saw posts about it at PRI and we had touched on it, I think, late last year, earlier this year with his race truck. But I wanted to ask you about that setup and, and the racing side on the 6-liter. What kind of new things or what you guys are shooting for in 2020? We have gone so far beyond the realm of normal with that engine that last year we spent so much time um, and work with trying to make 
um, doing something completely radically different. And we were using um, we were using some of the top fuel, and we still are some of the top fuel, uh, uh, some of the pistons, some of the coatings, some of the um, different processes um, to put together this engine. And we've tried certain things. Certain things didn't work for us. Certain things did work for us. And we've done, there's really not anything in that engine that is actually, uh, that resembles anything that's actually been done in the power truck platform ever. So uh, this last year was a learning curve for us a lot on what to do, what not to do. And um, so we wound up uh, uh, revamping some stuff. And we made some custom, uh, some some custom things, uh, sleeves particularly, that would work with um, some of the stuff that Matt was wanting to do with some of the C-ring setups um, and some things that we found that um, that just will not work with a C-ring setup. Um, and we've found some things that just wouldn't work with that particular the piston uh, setup that we were trying to do. So all that, you know, we went through, and, and you know, that's part of R&D. That's, you know, you really can't, Bring, you know, we were talking to the, the piston manufacturer and asking them, hey, you know, what should we do? And they've been awesome to work with, and they're a fantastic company. It's just, it's not, there's no information out there because nobody's done it. And when that's the case, you are the guinea pig. And, you know, you know you're know, you breaking new ground, Copernicus. So, I mean, really, it's, it's you out there, and, and you're the one trying to figure this stuff out, and they're trying to lend as much support as they can. Um, but at some point, it's just you're going to have to roll up your sleeves and, and uh and go to work and just test and ride. So um, we did that last year and or this year, and um, I think we got everything that we were um, really uh, struggling with to get right uh, this year. Uh, we've got the the other engine that we've got built. Um, we've got actually two engines that we're uh, that he's going to be uh, outfitted with for next year, and one of them uh, he has in his possession right now, and it uses um, an extra. It's a it's a massive sleeve that this thing uses. It looks like it came out of a DT530. It's it's enormous. But um, anyways, it's not not just that. We're using a uh, uh, basically a line to line coating uh, with some really weird clearances uh, and tolerances that were that were used. Uh, some 2618 billet pistons and and things like that. Some compression ratios that were um, very very low for that. Uh, for that particular setup, but he is spraying massive amounts of nitrous to this thing, and it was kind of funny. I think that uh, David Freiberger, um, when he was there last year, uh, he said, we almost uh, gave you all the award for uh, the nitrous award because of the sheer amount of nitrous that you're actually <laughs> running through this engine. It's insane. So <clears throat> um, there's a ton of that that's being you know, being used. So, um, anyway, so we've 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 done uh, some things with that. We've uh, are we're also working with Comp on some of the stuff with the camshafts, which is really cool because uh, here to four, you know, Comp wasn't really in the diesel world, um, but and we're working really close with them to help uh, develop some of the stuff. Uh, working with them on uh, excited about um, working with them on their Spintron and and doing some testing there, and uh, with Billy Godbold who is uh, the guy's literally a genius. I mean, he has um, he has a um, <laughs> the mad scientist degree. So literally, but um, it's it's really exciting to see what we've you know the, the doors uh, Lord just opened for us to do uh, different things with with companies that are major players in the gasoline world, but not not necessarily something that they are known for in the diesel world or ever really done. Um, that are marketed in the diesel world. So they're not far from us. They're probably about an hour from us. Uh, so it works out really well. They're kind of in our back door, uh, so to speak. So we've been uh, working with them. And then, of course, UEM, um, who has been fantastic. Chris has been awesome to work with over there. Just super people. You couldn't ask for a better group of, of guys over there. And we're really, really appreciative and thankful for them. And um, so we've worked with them on some of their their piston staff coming out for the uh, for the diesel market as well. So uh, there's it's it's good for the industry. Everything that we're doing is yeah. I mean Matt's motors great. We're going to do. We're, we're excited about doing some really cool stuff and pushing that power stroke platform. But <coughs> excuse me, 
while we're pushing the PowerStroke platform for him and developing new products and we're pushing that, we're also bringing in, you know, these companies that, like I said, are not in the same realm and we're bringing them with us. Or they're, they're going with us. They're, they're, we're hooking onto their kind of chariot, so to speak, and, and I'm just excited to be with him. But it's also helping everybody else in the industry because now it's going to provide guys that uh, are wanting quality parts. Um, it's going to give them an outlet for that too. So, you know, it's good for us. It's good for the, the companies we're working with because it's a new market for them, but it's also great for the end user. It's a really exciting component of, I think, where diesel is at right now versus, you know, in the past, there might only be one or two choices, and it, it, it wasn't on the radar of the bigger companies that had specialized in gas performance or racing for so long, whereas now they have the infrastructure, the machines, the, the engineers, research and development, the logistics that they've been doing for 30, 40 years or longer and are able to take advantage of that in a way to produce these parts for diesel engines with a six liter, six, four, six, seven, or whatever it might be. And use those components in a race vehicle or something like a, a daily driver or, you know, something that's being worked every day. And I think that's really exciting to be able to hear that and then see what you guys are doing to make that happen. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot of products out there right now that we're currently testing. Um, so mid-year um, should be an, should be a, um, uh, a great time for, for the guys that are looking for, especially, like I said, in, in context of what we're talking about, especially for the Power Stroke guys, because um, uh, hopefully by that time we will have uh, finished testing and we'll start being able to release some of the things that we've been working on. Uh, for so long, so I'm really, really, uh, really stoked to see that come to fruition. Um, it's um, it you don't realize how long it takes to take something from a thought to a design to you know a drawing uh, and then to a tool path and then to the actual part that you have and then test it and then you know revamp it and then go back and forth and back and forth. It's it's a you know I mean it's not like you're developing a, a bolt or a screw or something like that I mean these these are products that if you want it to be right there's a lot it doesn't happen by accident to have a quality part where it fits just right and where it works just right it's there's a lot involved in that um, and you know I would love to be able to pop out a product you know left and right and say hey it's ready to go but before we do and we put our name on it we want to make sure that we've done everything we can to test it and make sure that uh, it's going to do everything we said it's going to do and it's going to hold up. And uh, and we're I mean the prospects are are very bright on the stuff that we've been working on and um, so it's 2020 should be uh, the Lord's help 2020 should be a, a really really good year we're excited to um, you know we're in a better position now than we've ever been um, we have uh, we have not just the equipment and, and the capabilities now um, and the education of of some of the things that uh, of how to get to the end goal. I mean, you, you start out with a product and you're thinking, you know, this is what I want to do. But then, you know, a lot of the problems that we we run into in, in the industry is that you come up with an idea and you go, okay, all right, I want this. I think what would really work would be, you know, that we are, if we made this, pro this product. So you go and you try to pitch it to somebody and they go, okay, that's great. Um, we'll do, you know, we'll do five thousand of them. Well, I don't know if five thousand of them are going to sell. I mean, I don't know if five hundred of them are going to sell. Right now, I just really, I, I need to get to market, you know, to be able to see. Let me, let me get some prototypes up, and and then that starts to slow the process down because you know you can't commit to such a large volume on something like that. Um, the neat thing that we've been able to do is our shop is extremely unique. It's not just that, it, again, I've said this a million times before, but it's not that our shop's just a repair facility because Diesel Doctor and Chode Engineering Performance are two separate companies. They're sister companies. It's not that Chode Engineering just does the engine side of things now, um, and we've been building engines, and uh, we fix the, the problems with them, but we also are able to do in-house uh, our own machining and our own parts manufacturing, not just the engine building side, but now we're able to take all that stuff that we're thinking about doing and we're actually starting to make our own parts and, and do all that so that 
we don't have to go out and we don't have to say, hey, can you do five, you know, can you do 50 of these parts for me? Because most people wouldn't even look at you uh, for 50 parts. They don't even mess with you because it's a lot of time invested in designing and learning all that stuff. People don't get it. They think, well, I'll buy a CNC machine. I'll go to work. Yeah, good luck with that. It doesn't exactly work that way. The green button, you know, I just walk up there and put the material in and hit the green button. It doesn't work that way. There's a lot of forethought that goes in. There's a lot of a lot of time spent in front of a computer long before you ever hit the green button. Um, so it's really cool that we're able to do that now. So we have huge we have huge capabilities that we uh, we hadn't had before. That's a huge huge point, and it's something I've heard before on podcasts talking with business owners that are making their own parts and they they talk about this this process they go through where they're outsourcing components of, of what they're building and sometimes they can be great and great for years and then you get a bad batch and then you put it out there and then it's like the public's like well this doesn't work this failed it did did all these things and I think to be able to bring that all within your control and the processes that you have and and in the quality checks is so important. I think, you know, like for what you guys are doing, and we talked about this recently as well, not to change the subject, but we were just chatting. You're like, we're so busy. And you had all these new hires and these new things that you guys are doing in the expansion. And it's been really cool to be able to chat with you through the process over the last, you know, 18 months, almost two years to see how you've been able to do this and grow it in the, in the power stroke platform with the logistics, the, the people, the people that make it happen, being able to bring the parts manufacturing in-house to control more of it. So when you put something in a box, ship it out or on a crate, you know, you know, every part that went into it, who made it, when they made it, all those things. So when the customer gets the product, there isn't that guesswork of, you know, I outsource this. Was it a good day or bad day? Right. Well, you know, and I'm not trying to bust in my shop. I'm really, you know, this is not the intention of it, but you just jogged my memory. So I'm going to run with it. Um, what people do not get in this industry, the general public doesn't get, um, and this is a taboo. So, you know, this is kind of one of those things. I don't know if you ever, I don't know if you ever watched that show. Uh, when I was a kid, I liked it because it was, it was a guy that would show the magic trick and how it was done. Do you have to wear the mask? Yeah. You know, because he was afraid if anybody ever knew, you know, they're going to kill him. Um, <laughs> it's kind of that way in the industry though. They're going to go mad at you. But there's so much white boxing. That they call it quote unquote white boxing. It goes on, and it's just repulsive to me. I absolutely hate it. Uh, it's where, if people that don't know, it's where you basically go out to another company and you tell them, you know, make this part. I know you're making this part for so-and-so. You make this part for me, and you put my name on it instead of their name on it. So everybody gets the same part. They just don't realize it, and they wind up getting, you know, a different name or a different box. And that's, that's totally um, crooked in my book. That's not right because I buy because I trusted that brand. <clears throat> I remember when I was in the... Growing up as a kid in the appliance business, when that started happening, we started seeing that. Used to years and years and years ago, and this is way back when, you know, you would buy a Kenmore washing machine or you would buy, you know, a G washing machine, and you would go, okay, that's who made that because that was their name on it. Now you have to look at the first three digits of the model number because if you don't, it doesn't matter that it says Kenmore on the front of it. It doesn't matter that it says Samsung on the front. Actually, Samsung made that for Kenmore. And if it doesn't say 106 on the front, then that's not actually made by, which Kenmore actually never made anything. Whirlpool made it, you know. And it's just, again, I grew up in that business. And that's it's funny how you start seeing all this stuff transfer over. And it's just a marketing deal, and I get it. It's a way to make money. But um, we don't do that. If, we, if we're going to wind up, uh, you know, outsourcing to a company, I'm going to straight up tell you, this is the company that actually made that for us. This is the piston company that we use, uh, whether it's Mala or UEM or um, the camshaft company that we're making. I don't want to put my name on something that we didn't actually make. Um, and if we did, I want to be upfront and honest with you and tell you that. I've seen in the past where uh, competitors have literally put their name on the bottom of a piston that the, the manufacturer – did the fly cutting for them, and then they're calling it their piston, and they're calling it, they're the ones that manufactured it. And I have to go up to SEMA, and I pick up this piston, I'm looking at it, and I go, oh, my gosh, you got to be kidding me. That's, you know, they're using this, and they're putting their name on it, and they're calling it theirs, and they're calling it that all this is done in-house, and it's not. It's If you're going to do it in-house, do it in-house. Otherwise, just be honest about it, you know. Um, so, and again, it does help with quality control. Um, 
being able to do stuff in house. At some point, you're going to get to a volume. It's like anything else. When people want, you know, Henry Ford didn't assemble every, you know, Model T that went out of, out of the factory. At some point in time, you have to start getting help, um, and that's that's fine. You know, you get to that understanding, you're going to grow to that size. Um, there's other, you know, and that's when you start looking at different avenues. But uh, it's uh, white boxing, and 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 there's other key words for it that they like to call it. It's just to me, it's completely unacceptable, and it it leads to um, a uh, kind of a degradation. It, it leads to it, it, it doesn't help. It doesn't help the market because it floods it with the same product, different pricing, um, and just a bunch of yeah, it's just a bunch of truths what it what it really deals with, and that's one of the reasons why we decided to do the way again go the way we went. I think especially with engines, whether they're racing or for a daily driver, it's a it, it's an expensive purchase and there's so much that's attached to it whether it's working and making money or driving across the country for a race or it's a special project that you're helping somebody with it's so much more specialized than you know something we can buy off off amazon or something like that where as long as it works it works it doesn't really matter who made it it's not the same with diesel engines or racing just engines in general yeah yeah that's absolutely it is true um it's uh you know you're not buying a ballpoint pen i mean it's it, you're dependent on this thing every day to to make it to work um and you're spending money because you you're buying that because you you have trust in it. you've done your homework uh, you found that's the company you want to deal with because they have a good reputation and the problem man I, what really gets you and you can't come out and say it because if you did they'd stone you but um what you want to do is people come out there and go like oh man i wouldn't buy this product you know this product from joe blow he, you know, this is junk. The only one I'm going to buy it from is so and so. And I'm thinking to myself, what's funny about this? And sitting back, we know it on this side of the industry, and you know it too, Patrick. But uh, we all know it on this side of the industry because we we're involved in this thing very much. So we know everybody behind the scenes, and we're, you know we're friends with the guys. But what blows me away is these guys over here that are barking about it on Facebook, and you're going. What that goober doesn't know is that guy made it for that guy, you know. And that's it's it's ridiculous. Um, but you know, again, like I said, it's taboo. But we we chose to go a different route, um, and that was one of the reasons why we chose to go that route. Something that we're probably looking at eventually getting into. Um, and you know, we've we've talked about it before. It, we've got so much on our plate right now, but eventually, I tend to get into the more of the metrology side where people are sending me parts and then I can reverse engineer uh, the parts and then send them the CAD files. And if they want to make their own, you know, stuff, well, that's fine. I can do all the design work. I do all the cam work and send it back to them and say, okay, you know, just put this in your USB drive and, you know, set your work offset and hit the green button and, uh, and do that. And that's another, that's another side of it that we've, we've considered doing before, but there's, there's a lot of avenues for us to, to go down because, I remember um, when I started this business, um, and this is a tip to other companies. And I see guys out there all the time. They go, well, "I'm just going to buy my own CNC machine." This is a this is a big tip for you uh, because I found myself in this one time. Um, I had a guy that I'd hired because I didn't know anything about the CNC side. Um, I knew the manual side of it, but I didn't really know the CNC. We had a machine there, one particular machine that I always depended on this other guy to run. And uh, one day. And he knew that I didn't know how to do it, and he kind of lorded that over me a little bit. And, you know, it's never been a good situation to be the servant as being the boss. You know what I mean? You don't want to yeah. be to the point, you know, where this guy, he knows you. He's got you, you know, uh, by the neck, and you really don't really have a choice. You kind of got to go along with whatever. If he has a bad day at work, well, you can't push him too hard because he walks out. Nobody knows how to grind cranks. You know, you're done for that day. You know, you can't do that. Um, but anyway... He wound up leaving, uh, and, uh, you know, we, we split ways on it. And uh, anyways, here I am left with a mean that, and it was an older CNC, and I didn't uh, I didn't know uh, how to program that machine. And I remember looking at it, and I'm like, that's great. Here I own something I don't even know how to run. And to be honest with you, I don't even know anybody to call in a 150-mile radius that can tell me how to run this machine. And I'm stuck. Um, so I learned... From that point, that day, uh, that I will never have any particular, there's not one particular thing in that shop anywhere that if that guy that's working that machine walked out tomorrow, 
that I can't program it, I can't pick it up, or I didn't already, you know, write the program and he's run the program for me. I want to be able to know, I want to be the central, you know, intelligence system for everything that goes out of that, that shop. And I know that people go, well, that's micromanaging. It is, uh, and, and I know it's, it's not right, basically, to, it, it can hold a company back at a certain extent. Um, but as long as I know, I don't mind, I want other people to know and then to grow, I just want to make sure that I have the foundation of everything that's going on, um, just because I don't like being in that predicament. I don't like being in the predicament where the guy can just walk out and leave me high and dry. I've got a family to feed, and I've got people that I've promised, you know, this work will be done at so-and-so time. So if it, you know, it wound up coming down to it, I still have the, you know, the ability and the knowledge to get everything done. So That's a fantastic point because we do see that a lot and it's like i'm going to buy this machine or it could be any number of things not even related to engines but just in the automotive world to be able to offer these new products or do these new things and it's an investment but it's also like you mentioned an investment of your time to learn it so that maybe you need to train two or three people how to run it maybe somebody moves to a different position maybe they want to get into a different side of the company that you have and that machine's not running well kind of the whole operation can can stop or slow down yeah it is it's a um and it's it's a lot easier to teach somebody how to run something than it is to program something i mean there's there's a machine they call them machine attendance for a reason um and no disrespect but i mean there's a lot more to you know you can get as deep as you want to on some of those things but i, I mean like i said i see a, a lot of that in the industry and guys talking well i'll just get into this i don't think that i know that i didn't realize how deep you you know really can go with this thing this thing can this is a whole nother avenue i mean it opens up a lot of doors but boy you better be ready to to hang on because uh, the learning curves on those things are, i mean it's it's straight up there's a lot to uh, a lot to know especially uh, the more involved you get in uh, the programming side of things but i, I mean I, I digress on that I, the whole point of it is is this um we want to be self-sufficient uh, self-sustained i should say uh, kind of sovereign in the way that we they operate. I don't want, you know, I don't want to be dependent on another company um, so much to the point where uh, if they decide that, you know, that they're not going to sell me this part or that part because they want to make that dollar now, that I've, now I'm stuck between the customer and between this guy that's kind of lording that over me. We have all those capabilities now in-house. So it's, it, like I said, 2020 should be, uh, Lord willing, a, um, exciting time for us I'm, I'm looking forward to it and and seeing what the prospects um, basically whatever everything comes to fruition i mean we've we've got a lot of uh, uh irons in the fire right now for sure you know one thing when uh whenever we record an episode i always love to watch the comments especially on youtube and i know a lot of our power stroke fans they gravitate gravitate towards your episodes because they're they're really detailed and they provide a lot of information and you know, we've covered the, the 60. We talked or you know, did like almost a second episode a bit about the 64 and some things you guys are working on. But there's this other large part of Power Stroke fans we have that have a 2011 to you know current 67, and they're like, well, what about us? And I know there's some things you're working on, and it may not be quite ready to to talk about all of it. But for the 67 owners that are listening, and they, you know they they want to know what you guys are doing or seeing you know, with those engines, what, what do you think is going to be coming up here, you know, in the next six months or a few months that, that'll have some solutions or upgrades for those guys? Um, upgrades, as far as the long block's concerned, I can lay that out for you pretty easy right, uh, right now. Um, I don't know how much I want to spoil, uh, full alert for any other further episodes that we might do on the six sevens, but, um, you know, we, people don't realize how many, the issues, especially in the earlier models uh, of the 6.7, there really are. And there's guys that are going to say, oh, you know, I've ran this hole, um, and what you're saying isn't true, and all this other stuff that you're going to get. But um, the 6.7s, we, we, we have done a lot of uh, R&D with the 6.7 to make sure that we're addressing all the problems that come from the factory, uh, the, the inerrant prop, problems with the engine. But um, one of the things that we see, and uh, you know, some of the, well, I'm trying to, I'm trying not to give you too much information right now, <laughs> uh, but give you enough that that the people can appreciate what we're doing with them. Uh, the six, seven biggest failures that we see, okay, 
So I'll go out of this direction. Okay, the six seven, the, the biggest failure, hands down, no questions asked, is spun bearings. Guaranteed, always, it seems like every every core that we get comes in, it's always got some spun bearing in it, rod bearing, main bearing, all the time. Um, so this is not, again, I'm wanting to help the PowerShell community. Um, I, it's not always about making a dollar. It's not about making a dollar. It's uh, about winning a guy's trust so that when he, I had a guy, perfect example, okay? I had a guy come in this week. I did not even remember this. This is a local customer. But the guy goes, hey, um, he said, I brought my truck in here, and uh, Ford said it needed a, a camshaft. Straight up, what they told him, um, but it was it wound up being uh, it may have been electrify. I don't know. I didn't diag that truck. But somebody else did. But anyways, um, they said he said I need a new engine. But I brought my truck back to you because uh, several years ago I had a flat tire and you came out there and you didn't charge me anything and you you know you changed my tire for me. I just thought you know that's crazy. This guy remembered me and to be honest with you, I don't even remember it because it was that long ago. I've slept since then. I don't remember anything on that kind of stuff. My mind's running a 1,000 miles an hour. But he remembered me, and I had his trust back in the day when, you know, he needed my help, and I didn't charge him anything. I was more than happy to do it. Um, it's more about that lifelong customer. I want that guy. Uh, I love having the guy, that's his dad, and we did work for his, his truck. We built a transmission or an engine or whatever, and he tells his son, hey, that's the guy you want to get your stuff done. You know, that's the shop you want to do your stuff. And that's the trust. I would rather be believed than I would have a, a, a single dime. It means more to me because that is that that's something that's I place like I said before in other uh, episodes. I place that above anything else. Um, but anyway, uh, as far as getting back to to uh, the this information that I'm fixing to give, it doesn't necessarily make me any money. Um, it will help the customer for the six seven. Uh, one of the big, big issues that we have is seeing these bearings spin and reasons for the bearing spin is that most folks don't realize on the 6.7 that the clearances on the 6.7 are much, much, much tighter than that of a conventional 6.4, 6.0, 7.3, 5.9, 6.7, Cummins, doesn't matter, any other engine out there. Uh, but for some reason, the 6.7 engineers decided on the power stroke platform <coughs> to tighten the clearances to 7 tenths. Um, so seven tenths of an uh, of a uh, of an inch, which to give you kind of perspective of that is that's roughly the human hair is three thousandths. So you can figure about one fourth of the human hair is how tight the rod bearing uh, can be in some uh, of these engines. So that's on both sides. That is what we would call you know that's that's not a, that's diameter. So you would split that. So if it's actually seven tenths, that is three and a half tenths on either side of the rod. That's insanely tight. The issue that – the reason why we're having so many of these issues is because guys go, well, you know, my granddad ran a 15W40 oil, and my, you know, uncle runs a 15W40 oil, and everybody does. So they just slap 15W40 oil in the truck, uh, especially trucks that are up north, and they will run them with heavyweight oil. And the problem uh, with it is is – for oil to do its job, it's basically four things it takes. It takes the right oil, the right place, the right amount, the right time. Like Lake Speed, you know, he's he used to work with Driven. He's actually with uh, Total Seal now. But anyways, uh, uh, that is what's necessary. The problem with it is, is on the six sevens, the oil system is from, you know, it's two miles down the road, and then you've got to route it all the way up uh, and across to the oil cooler, to the filter, to the camshaft, to the front before it starts oil and basically anything. Um, and it's, it takes a long time to get that oil moving. And it starts spinning these bearings. And everybody starts blaming because the Ford, you know, they start saying, well, Ford Motor Company never put tangs on the bearings. It's nothing to do with it. Crush is what keeps the bearing in place. The tang does nothing but actually help the guy, the installer, in placement. Um, but the things that we do to help that um, on the engines that we build, even if a guy was to send us a brand-new Ford short block, uh, we completely disassemble the engine, and then we actually alter the clearances and the crankshaft and the rods so that they are opened up more. Um, you can get away with more clearance anytime, a lot easier than you can too little a clearance. It will always bite you in the end. Um, so uh, we uh, alter the, the oiling system, and we fix that. The crankshaft, you know, we've seen 
where the gear is a press on gear and it has no alignment pin there it spins and it it bends all 32 push rods um, we actually are, are we uh, TIG weld that to the snout so um, that there's a, absolutely no way that that gear can actually spin there's a lot of things that we do though to fix a 67 so if you're listening and you have a 6.7 engine um, most of the service manuals you'll see are going to tell you to run a five weight, maybe a ten weight oil. Um, look and find out what temperatures, uh, the parameters that you're spo you're supposed to be running in. Run that engine oil, uh, that weight oil that you're you're uh, you're supposed to be running, or the climate that you're in. The engineers designed it specifically for a reason. They they put that particular uh, specification oil for a reason, and they're not as stupid as what people want. To make them out to be, um, there's I know the reasons why they did that. Uh, a lot of it has to do with um, uh, with fuel consumption, and some of it has to do with emission systems. Um, but at any any rate, those are the cards you're dealt. Unless you have an engine from us, run those weight oil. Um, if you're running a, a um, an engine from us, we have a different specification because we've altered it. So uh, that helps because. Like I said, the vast majority of the problems and the failures that we see out of six sevens are spun bearings. We'll definitely have to do a uh, six seven specific episode when uh, when you guys have some of these these things you're working on ready to go. I, one of my favorite things is to follow you guys on on social media. I always see teaser pictures that spark a question that I'm going to ask you when we record an episode. But for any new listeners we have out there, where can they find you guys on Facebook and Instagram? Uh, yeah, you can check us out at uh, ChodeEngineeringPerformance.com for our uh, website. Uh, you can check us out at Chode Engineering Performance on Facebook or uh, Diesel Doctor Tennessee. Uh, on uh, That's more of the repair side, but if you're interested in the engine building side and stuff like that, um, you can uh, check us out there. And um, the Instagram, I don't even know what our uh, – it's, it's uh, hashtag Chode Engineering Performance. So um, – you can uh, follow us along there. We try, I try to post as much as I can. I guess I'm uh, I've been a little bit behind you know, since TRI and stuff, but we we hope to uh, to, to get back on that. Awesome! It was fantastic to learn more about power strokes and some of these fixes that we get tons of questions on from six O's to six sevens, and there's so much information we gotta you kind of kind of take it you know episode by episode. But it's always it's always great to, to see what you guys are working on, see the growth that you guys have, and then what you're doing for the Power Stroke community. Well, I sure appreciate you having us on and, and look forward to um, to be able to uh, kind of elaborate some more on some of the six seven stuff as we as we progress. Don't forget, Diesel fans, if you have any questions about your 7.3, 6 liter, 6.4, six, 6.7 six, Power Stroke, whether you need an engine for your work truck or it's a, a race build that, that you're planning, give the guys over at Chode Engineering a call. Let them know what you're working on. They're more than happy to help you out. Till next time, keep the shiny side up.